If you're new to semi-hydroponics or passive hydroponics, something you might find difficult, even with the amount of guides available on the internet right now, is finding the right gear to use. If you're looking for that kind of gear and some help in trying to decide how you should run your semi-hydro setup at home, I've put together this guided tour to try and help you find what might work for you in setting up your environment at home for growing successfully in semi-hydro. If you're new to the channel, which is probably the vast majority of you watching this. My name is Nick and this is Propist. I have changed my channel name. I haven't filmed in a while. If you're more interested in finding out about that, you can check it out at the very end. For the time being, I want to talk to you about semi-hydro and get into some of the awesome <laughs> and not so awesome pieces of tech or gear, things like that, that you can use to help your semi-hydro setup be a little bit more optimized, efficient, aesthetically pleasing, maybe not so much. Generally speaking, at least a little easier to manage. The things I'm not going to cover today are soilless media, things like leca, pawn, perlite, pumice, all those fun things that you use to fill your containers with that you work with in semi-hydro. I'll save that for another day. There's plenty of guides out there on the YouTubes and on the internets if you want to go check those out. I think talking about soilless media for semi-hydro probably requires its own video, so I'm going to leave that out today. But if you're interested, let me know in the comments and I'm happy to put something together to talk about that. The other thing I'm not going to talk to you about today is semi-hydro nutrients because again, it kind of requires its own video. There's plenty of great videos out there talking about it. I would encourage you to go check out Minimalist Cali. I will link her in the description. She was the one who kind of got me onto my semi-hydro journey a couple years back now. And also Kevin over at Hakuna La Planta is inspirational. I have watched probably the vast majority of his videos. I am a big fan. And if you are interested in growing gigantic plants in semi-hydro, he's your guy so I'll link him in the description as well if you're curious as to where I'm planning to take this video the main kind of highlight areas that I had in mind were pots net pots probably talk a bit about wicking and things like that also how to deal with climbers and crawlers and at the end of that we've probably got a few accessories we can talk about too so I won't go through everything I've got here and I do have a couple of plants on display back here that are all in semi-hydro and all doing quite well. So I'll try and use a few examples of plants that I know are thriving in semi-hydro and bring those out so you can take a look at them as we kind of work our way through these different configurations. So just to lay the groundwork here for the fundamentals of why semi-hydro is interesting and important. I think if, you, if you've gotten this far and you've already decided I'm going to go into semi-hydro and I'm going to start messing around with it as an experiment, or I want to, you know, transfer all of my plants into semi-hydro, which is, I'd say I've probably got 80 to 85% of my plants in semi or passive hydroponics right now. I think what you probably want to get out of this is the major pros and cons. This applies to both folks who have, you know, lightly dabbled in semi-hydro, have never used it before. If you use it regularly, you probably know all this already, but semi or passive, depending on what you want to call it, uh, hydro is basically using inert media in nutrient solution of some sort. No soil. Your plant is living in a non-nutrient rich environment. It has its roots sitting mostly in some sort of substrate that has no nutrients. It's typically inert. So while this video is not about why you should or shouldn't choose passive hydroponics, I will give you the 10,000 foot view as to why it's good for me and why I use it. Uh, and you can kind of make your own judgment as to whether or not that makes sense for you. Personally, the reason I use semi-hydro is because I don't like having soil in my house. That's pretty much the vast majority of the reason. Soil leads to a lot more things like bugs, potentially mildew, bad odors, you know, lots of fun stuff like that. But I mean, the, the bugs and the soil tend to come hand in hand. And as much as you can get, you definitely can get bugs uh, and critters of all shapes and sizes in passive hydro, there's just less of them. Also, I find it's messy soil compared to working with pond or leca. Uh, pond can be messy too, but in a different way. I think dealing with soil as uh, a gardener, who I, and I work with soil outside regularly, um, and I do a lot of outdoor gardening, I try and keep my lives separate. So my aeroids and my tropicals and my hoyas and all that kind of fun stuff live mostly indoors in grow tents and in Millsbow cabinets from Ikea, et cetera, um, and in a lot of Tupperware and Rubbermaid boxes. The stuff that I've got outside is all in soil and I use a completely different system, although I mean all the concepts are the same. So I tend to really kind of compartmentalize how I garden. 
how I grow functionally is very different, but the end results are the same at the end of the day. So in terms of why you would use one versus the other, I think everyone's got their choices to make there. But for me, it's really about like the cleanliness and avoiding bugs and the messiness of soil. So that's kind of why I use it. There's plenty of other good reasons for it because I mean, I think growing in Lekka or Pond, I mean, I've seen major advantages to growth rates. You have a lot more kind of fine tuning kind of control over your nutrients. You can have some even fine grain control over your substrate densities and all such fun stuff like that. Where personally, like as a, as a guy who works in technology and a bit of a gearhead, I enjoy the fine tuning and kind of tweaking aspect of it. So it's a lot of fun and it's just, less of a pain in the butt to deal with than container gardening and with soil, which I find painful. Although I do it outside, I prefer not to do it indoors. So that's kind of the long and the short of that. All right, so let's get into the gear. Now, keep in mind that the vast majority of what I've got to show you scales up in size reasonably well. I'm going to show you kind of like mid-sized stuff and on down. I don't have a ton of gigantic plants indoors that are in semi-hydro. I will eventually, but you know, some of these things I've been growing for a couple of years and I don't have any monstrous plants. I live in a pretty cold climate and I only got what I would say is my ideal setup recently. So like in the last three to six months, if you're thinking I have a gigantic Monstera that needs to go into a huge net pot and live in a huge pot, they're out there. They exist. They're maybe a little bit harder to find. You won't be able to just kind of order them from Amazon, but they are there. And I think you'll probably have to order some of those things kind of one off as opposed to buying a big bundle of things. I do prefer to buy stuff in bulk if I can. So I buy a lot of these things in bulk. And then as I size up, I work my way through the ladder. And then eventually I get to the big sizes that, you know, if you get to the big sizes, you're probably ordering stuff one off. I do think that the major thing that you'll run into with working with semi-hydro is that large containers are tough to fill. So you're gonna need a lot of LECA or a lot of pawn, which can get expensive if you're using the real stuff. And when I say real stuff, it's because you can make your own pawn. This is something that I can get into separately, but I won't today just for the sake of brevity. If you're on a budget, I would suggest Ikea is a great spot to buy nice looking cash pose and things like that. I can show you a couple of those. I've got these guys run for probably in the neighborhood of $2. I want to say maybe less. You can buy them. These are three inch at the top. Good size pot. It's great for semi hydro. These are plastic. They can fit a net pot in here. Uh, I will show you a little bit later. You can then size up to some larger pots. I think these are six inch pots. This guy is again, Ikea. These go for somewhere under $10, I believe. They come in various colors. There's a bunch available. These are ceramic. They're pretty hefty. Um, it's not going to fall, and if it does fall on you, it will hurt. There's also these guys, a number of different sizes available. I do have one over here that is filled with Lekka. Looks good. This is a uh, Syngonium Wendlandii scrambled eggs that I picked up not too long ago. Um, still kind of rehabbing it. You can see it's got a little bit of the variegation here on the leaves here. Um, looking pretty good for the most part. This was not an import at some point, but it has been in uh, North America for a little while. And I did pick it up, I wanna say probably about two weeks ago, might've been a little bit more than that. And it's still sitting in a closed container right now as I acclimatize it to my home. Again, that was the larger size of this guy and this come in a number of different sizes. Those are really fantastic pots because they're cheap. They do work really well with a variety of sizes of net pot. As you can see here, I've got, and I'm gonna try and do this without blowing it up. I do have these guys in Lekka. I think this is a, five and a half inch net pot inside. Don't quote me on that, that may be off by half an inch. Those containers are fantastic. You can use them as cash pose. I personally use them in the rare instances that I don't want to use a clear container. One thing about these little Ikea containers is that they make them in plastic and they also make them in metal. And if you're dealing with hydro or semi-hydro or passive hydro, whatever you want to call it, I would suggest not buying the metal ones. I think they work really nicely as cash bows. And if you're using soil, sure. Uh, maybe you got a succulent in there, it makes sense. But when you have nutrient solution in there, it gets cold, damn cold. And in the plastic, it's not so much of an issue, but when you're using a metal container, it's no bueno. So I had purchased a good 15 or 20 of those things 
and I get very little use out of them and I think I'm gonna end up selling them. Whereas these dudes, um, again, come in a multitude of sizes and I absolutely use them. So if you're gonna use the Ikea pots for semi-hydro, stay away from the metal containers because you're gonna regret it. It's gonna freeze your plant roots. They're not gonna be happy. Even in warmer climates, even in summertime, I found that those pots stayed pretty cold and my nutrient solution was running colder than all of my other pots. So avoid metal. For me, clear containers are the chef's kiss. I, uh, I love those things. I use these guys all the time. Actually, probably these guys a little bit more. These guys being the, I think, 24 ounce deli containers and these guys being the 32 ounce. So these guys I use for the majority of my plants. I mean, the guys sitting on the table here, two of these are in the 32 ounce containers. For anything that can fit its root ball into the 32 ounce, I use it. I can fit it inside of one of these. I can fit a four inch net pot and that works great. Another benefit of your clear containers is just being able to see the water level really easily. For me, that's a key thing. Like I have a lot of plants, like a hundred plus plants, maybe close to 200, I don't know, something like that. I haven't counted recently. But being able to see the water level in here is so important to me. Again, I can see exactly where that reservoir is filled up to. I can see how much water is sitting in there. And I don't have to do bottom third like you would with a lot of like like a containers. I do bottom third of the entire container, maybe even closer to 40%. And then I've got only the bottom little tip of the net pot sitting in there, but I still have a pretty good reservoir, which makes it less risky on my root system which is nice to know. So if you're wondering where a good spot to get those deli containers from is Amazon. I get all these guys from Amazon. These, like I said, 24, 32. I believe they also come in 64 and 128. I would love to get my hands on some of those really big ones like the 64s or the 128s, but they are not as easy to find in Canada as they are in the US. So if you're based in the US or somewhere in non-Canada, you'll probably have better luck than I did finding the larger ones. As far as pots go, other stuff that you can use. Again, on Amazon, a lot of these things are available. These are semi-hydro oriented pots. Um, sorry for the grime in here, there's a bit of dirt at the bottom there. These guys, I believe, I think this is a seven inch. These come with a water gauge, which I don't have this one currently installed, but this is one unit, slides in right there into the pot. And you can buy these, I think in three or four packs. These ones are Garden Basics. Uh, I did buy these on Amazon. They have a setup where they sit like so in the water and they wick up through the bottom. You can then set up your own wicking if you would like. Uh, I haven't had a ton of experience with these yet, but I do have a couple of my plants in them. Another one I particularly like is these crawler pots. Now, these are cool. Uh, I have one here. I have my Philodendron D. McDowell sitting in one of these pots right now. I believe this is an 11 inch. You can get they're from a different brand because again, this is Garden Basics, I think. You can get these in larger sizes like 14 and 17 inches. So, I mean, if this is 11 inches, 17 is gonna put you somewhere around here, which is a pretty good size crawler. You can fit a pretty thick trunk on here. The stem is gonna be sitting on top of the pot for the most part. And as you can see, it's multiple pieces again. You've got what is effectively a cash pro here that holds your nutrient solution and you have basically a net pot. It's not maybe, maybe not as clearly obvious as some of the other net pots I'm gonna show you, but these are net pots and inside of here, it actually has, I don't know if this is focusing, let's see. This flat wicking material kind of slips into these little slots at the bottom. I have supplemented these because these feel kind of flimsy to me. Like A, they're not gonna last very long. They're not very thick. And B, it, it doesn't provide a whole lot of wicking. Like there's only two of them. And I prefer to have good moisture all the way along the tray here. So I run personally a couple of pieces of wicking cord across the entire pot and kind of squish it through the external bits on either side make kind of a cross in the middle. Um, so what I've done with my other plants and my Dean McDowell and my Plum Annii are loving it so far. So I don't have a ton of crawlers. I have a Gloriosum as well that's sitting in there that seems to be pretty happy. So works for me. These pots are great. And I mean, they stack, you can buy them. I think they come in a three or four pack and they're not super expensive. Like they're pretty affordable. The larger pots I find are less affordable. The only thing I'd say is that these are plastic and maybe not the most appealing. If I could get this in white, 
or black or something uniform as opposed to this kind of multicolored setup. Like I think it comes in green and brown. Which one is this? That's a green one back there. Um, I would probably veer towards pure white if I could. This is my Philodendron Dean McDowell, uh, which is a hybrid between, I believe, a Gloriosum and a Pastazanum. This guy seems pretty happy. I only transferred him about a month ago into uh, this container. He was originally in one of these deli containers and he wasn't loving it because he is a crawler and he wanted more space. So I actually had, at the time, a thrips outbreak. I had to take off a lot of leaves off of this dude. He had a little bit of leaf burn from the lighting. And I believe also there might've been some thrips on here. I can see some thrips damage back here. It got munched a little bit before I caught them and sprayed them down. Um, this guy here is doing pretty good. It just popped the last couple of days. That's a nice leaf. I love the uh, Dean McDowell. And you can see here, there's actually a water meter at the bottom here. If I kept it flat, you would see it's pretty full. That indicator is a good gauge for what's going on water-wise. It does take quite a bit of LECA inside. I don't know if you can see the LECA in there. So this is topped off with LECA. As your crawler grows, as it extends the end of the pot, you're either gonna have to propagate and repot your top cutting, or you, know, you can chop it part way through and then maybe keep on regrowing it side by side in here. The other option is to repot into a bigger pot. But I think I've got a ways to go because he's only just kind of starting here in this pot. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, so far, pretty happy with it. Again, it uses a decent amount of LECA in these containers. So just keep that in the back of your mind that you're gonna need a, a good chunk of LECA to be able to move through and fill these up. Staying on the topic of small containers for your semi-hydro, I also have a pretty good collection of these Solo cups. I mean, these some of these are actually made by Solo and some of them are you know third-party brands. They are all over the place in terms of size ranges. They're anything from like two ounce uh, you can see here, they use these for like, you know, jello shots and fun stuff like that. I mean, these are shot glasses, whatever you want to call them. Um, moving up to, these are three different sizes I have, I think from ranging from seven to nine ounce. So this is, I want to say a seven ounce cup. This guy is, I think, nine ounce, but they come in two different form factors. So this one's kind of tall and skinny. The other one's kind of wide. They all fit different types of net pods, which is super useful. I just buy a pack of, you know, 20 to 50 of these things, maybe even 100, depending on what I'm doing. And I pick the appropriate container size based off the plant that I've got. So if it's got a root system, if it has a very small root system, you know, if I'm growing a, a baby alocasia, I can grow it in there um, and I can kind of work my way up. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. So this is kind of the nine ounce size here. I've got a Hoya. This is a Hoya Gnungading. And please don't come for me in the comments if I pronounce that incorrectly. This is a Hoya that A, looks awesome. Look at that texture, it's so reptilian. Um, it sun stresses super nicely as well. I picked this up recently and I am rooting it in a combination of pawn and it's got this small orchid pot in here. As you can see, it's like a slitted orchid pot sitting inside of one of these cheapo plastic containers. But you know what? I am a big fan, as I mentioned, of clear containers. And the reasons I like clear containers, I can see the roots. That's the number one thing. So you can see here, this thing is rooting pretty good here. There's already roots popping out. And I only just popped this into this container in the last two weeks. And I've already got roots coming out the bottom, which is fan fantastic. Also means that I should start getting a little bit of growth soon here. So I am very excited to see this thing grow up. You've actually got roots. If you can see that, there's some roots on the top that are starting to pop out. That is also the fun thing about Hoyas is that they can root all along the vine and all along the stem there, which is nice. So I'm really looking forward to growing this guy out. But again, so this is, a two and three quarter inch, I can't eyeball this orchid pot that I've got. I'm using this as a net pot and there's some wick coming out. It's a little green. You can see that's the one major con of using clear containers. The one major con being algae. And I think that's an unavoidable tragedy of clear containers, but all the pros of being able to see your roots and knowing when the algae is becoming an issue is counterbalanced by the fact that algae is an issue and you're gonna have to probably clean your containers at the very least on a regular basis. I maybe get a little lazy about that. I'm sure you can probably see that. This is algae ridden back here, but 
uh, if I'm in the middle of watering something, or particularly if I'm in the middle of flushing my medium, so either the LECA or the pond that I'm using, I will take advantage of that time to probably clean the cover pot or the deli pot that I'm using or whatever it is in that case, it's either a regular pot or not. Take, the, take advantage of that time to clean the inside of it, get rid of some of that algae as much as I can. And if I'm repotting, I will often clean out the net pot that I'm working with. I will clean the media as well. Um, in terms of like, you know, washing your leca, rinsing it off, giving it a good scrub if you want to. You can boil it, you can do a lot of fun stuff like that. There's actually some products that, you know, General Hydroponics, which I personally use for my nutrient solution. They make a product called Flora Clean that you can use. It's no different than you maybe cleaning it yourself, but you can run that through while you're flushing your leca, for instance, and it will help clean everything that's in there. So, I mean, you can kind of take your pick. There's a bunch of different options for cleaning your medium, but that's something that I take advantage of when I'm doing certain kind of maintenance tasks or, you know, like I said, repotting, um, you know, just checking the roots, etc. That's a good time to do that sort of thing. So let's talk about net pots because that's something that took me quite a while to pick up on. Uh, there's quite a huge variety of net pots out there and there's pros and cons to different kinds of net pots. And I think that knowing some of these pros and cons early before you start buying stuff will save you a lot of hassle and hopefully will save you uh, learning the hard way like I did and I ending up stuck with a bunch of junk that you really don't want. I'm gonna show you guys a variety of pots. So I'll start off with the actual net pots. So these here, so I've got a whole selection of net pots. Let me burn through a couple of these. Uh, start with the smaller sizes here. I've got quite a range of tiny net pots. So these are pretty cool. Starting off with the really small net pots. These guys here, very, very small. You can't fit a whole lot of Leka in there and putting pond in here is pretty much gonna strain right out of there. So I've used these for Leka. I honestly wouldn't recommend this small size because with Leka, unless you have really tiny Leka or using something like large coarse grain pumice, I probably wouldn't use these small ones. They are nice in that they fit into some of these little tiny, they call them cocktail. They're, they're very, very tiny containers. Again, somewhere in that kind of two ounce size. These ones don't fit perfectly, which is kind of what bugged me. I ended up stuck with mm, at least a hundred of these tiny containers. I do find that these are really nice if you're not using a net pot, you can just throw some pond in here and you can put something like an alocasia corm and it will be very happy in here. So. There's still purpose for these. Um, I can definitely use them when I'm selling stuff. So, you know, it's it's not a waste completely. Moving up a little bit, these guys are two more different sizes. Um, they fit inside each other. Again, the big difference here, like you'll notice is like, you know, some of these have a thicker rim around the edge. Uh, the lip there is really important for me. I try and make sure that the lip fits on top of at least one of the cup sizes that I've got, or uh, it can kind of hold itself up on the inside of the cup. So I, again, I've experimented with a lot of these. The big problem with these guys, as you can see, see that bottom? There's a big hole there. So trying to fit Leka in here and having it hold in doesn't work super well. Um, I do find these are not bad for putting sphagnum moss in here. Uh, it does dry out quickly, So, but if you're putting this into uh, let's say a Ziploc bag or something like that. This works for holding this Fagna Moss. I don't get a ton of use out of these tiny ones. That's just me. Now, moving on to the slightly larger size net pots. These guys are all kind of in the same territory of size range. I think there's these smaller ones that are probably in the two to two and a half inch range. Um, again, now we're getting to territory of like, this is pretty good. I can fit a decent amount of Leka in here. Um, I can put a pretty small plant that is still gonna have room to grow, breathe, the roots will be able to kind of pop out the sides and I won't lose my substrate. This is something I'll get back to in a second, but when you're working with Leka, these are nice, especially for smaller plants. Two different flavors of a similar net pot size. I believe these are three inch pots. It might be three and a quarter on the outer one here. These are from GrowPro. An interesting fact for this is that you're gonna find these commonly in, uh, maybe it's not so much of a surprise, in hydroponic stores. Now, the surprise for me is that that puts me into a, a zone that I maybe wasn't super familiar with before, which was particularly where I live in Vancouver, Canada, weed, growing weed is a thing here. And interestingly enough, a lot of people grow their weed in hydroponics. 
and full hydroponics. So a lot of the stores that sell these net pots in my local environment here tend to be stores that specialize in growing the, the Mary Jane. So if you're into that, I've made now a number of good friends at some of these stores. They do have a lot of good gear. So, and it's actually a lot of fun to go into those stores. Personally, I go to John's Plant Factory, which is just off the border of Vancouver and Burnaby here in BC. Those guys are awesome. If you wanna go in there and just shoot the shit about what kind of gear you're looking for, they get a lot of people from the YVR houseplant group, which is very popular here in Vancouver. I think it's got seven or 8,000 members. It's a Facebook group. Check it out. They seem to be very familiar with that group. And they always ask if you're coming in, like, are you, if you're dealing with tropical plants, are you from the group? That's what I've gotten a couple of times going in there, but now they know me well enough that they just know I'm there to buy stuff. So I get a lot of my net pods from them. I also buy uh, a lot of some of my grow equipment from them. I've bought a lot of stuff there um, and they are awesome. I actually buy my LECA there. My LECA is so much cheaper buying from them. I bought a huge 50 liter bag there for I think something like a third the price of buying on Amazon. So that's a pro tip for you is buy your supplies at the grow shops and not on Amazon because Amazon, particularly in Canada, you're not getting the best prices for some of these things. Now being said, bigger sizes. So this guy, I probably get the most use out of this one. This is a four inch net pot. It fits, again, Leka very, very well. Sits very nicely in here. I think I have a couple of these floating around here. I have my Alocasia Golden Bone, which you can take a look at here. I'm gonna show you this awesome leaf. I love this plant. This guy I actually got from Lauren at North Shore Tropicals, I think in the beginning of 2021. He has been through the wars. He has gone through two thrips outbreaks. He, as you can see, needs a repot desperately. As you can see, there's roots going up probably about two inches, two full inches outside of this pot. So um, he is, again, here is the, the drawback of using clear plastic pots and not giving it a good flush every once in a while. This guy's been sitting at the bottom of my grow tent for a while, kind of acclimatizing to my new grow tent, and he is full of algae right now. So really full of algae. Alocasias, however, are very, very fond of semi-hydro. This guy in particular, he has gone down to no leaves, I wanna say, and he has come back this is probably not the biggest leaf. This is, you know, it gives you a good size. It's kind of like the size of my head and I have a huge head. This is the newest leaf over here. I expect it's gonna keep on growing and he has popped for me a number of times. I have one of his children just sitting behind me here. This guy is actually sitting in one of these pots inside here. As I mentioned, I've got this little guy. This is the recent propagation from my Alocasia Golden Bone, which is sitting over here. This is also one of these smaller containers these smaller net pots in a nine ounce solo cup. Um, this guy probably needs a repot. He's definitely, well, probably needs a repot. You can see the, <laughs> the trunk on the rhizome here is getting a little out of control. This guy survived thrips as well recently and has put out this pup in the meantime, which is brand new and I hadn't even noticed it yet. So I just love these guys though. The golden bone is one of my favorites. You can see that leaf is spectacular and they do mature pretty nicely into these really big plants, which is great. And I mean, they can get a lot bigger than what I've got. So, you know, size of my head, they, they can easily double that. I've got a an Alocasia Watsoniana in my tent that is probably twice as big leaf-wise as that golden bone. The cool thing about the combination of the Deli Pot, this one being the 32 ounce, and the four inch net pot is that you can go like so, and they sit very comfortably in there. And there's that rim again. So the rim sits right on that little ledge inside. Now what I do to combat the problems of not being able to get the damn thing out afterwards, and you can probably see that from my Alocasia Golden Bone here, is maybe not the prettiest thing, but for me, it works. Electrical tape. There's <laughs> probably better ways of doing this, but for me, electrical tape, Works great for this. It's not the prettiest, but if you have a lot of plants, sometimes they're not on display and they're there for propagation purposes. Or if you are in the midst of building up your collection and you just need to put them somewhere, electrical tape, it works, it works. And I mean, like, again, I'm not gonna begrudge anybody their, uh, their style and their design sense, et cetera. And feel free to go back to using a nice Ikea pot if you want to. But for me, utilitarian guy, I am trying to keep my stuff under control. 
I like the tape, so it works for me. Now, you can get these containers, like this guy, I buy in a big bag of, this is Ohuhu brand. <laughs> I love the name, Ohuhu. This I bought off Amazon. This is a 25 pack. And this didn't set me back too much. It was pretty reasonable. There's enough competition on Amazon for these standard three and a half to four inch net pots that you can get them for a pretty good price. But they come in a pretty good size pack. Moving up in size, I've got some bigger ones here. So this guy is actually what I have my Syngonium scrambled egg sitting in. So this is the pot that's inside here. Again, you can see there's a little bit of electrical tape hanging out. This guy is, I believe, a five or a five and a half. Probably a five and a half because this is a six inch pot. So this six inch pot holds a pretty good amount. Now the only drawback here is that there's not a ton of room underneath the net pot. So a thing that you're gonna run into is that clearance underneath the net pot in the pot, in the outer pot that you're trying to use. For me, I like to have a gap underneath my net pot where I can have the wick drain through here and sit in the reservoir. So typically when I'm gonna set these things up, I want the reservoir to be like, you know, at least an inch underneath my net pot of reservoir so that I can fill it up and I don't have my roots sitting in water all the time. And you know, there's plants that take really well to sitting in water. Like, like Monstera deliciosa is very tolerant of sitting in water. And I've had my Thai constellation sitting in a net pot with most of its roots in water for over a year and it hasn't complained and root rot is not a problem there. Now, if I try to do the same thing with an anthurium, it's gonna freak out at me and do you know, the bad thing, it's gonna lose that root system and I'm gonna end up having to cut off a lot of roots that are getting a little soggy in the water. That's something that you, you kind of have to play it by ear. Different plants, different genuses do better in semi-hydro and different genuses do better with their roots actually sitting in the reservoir. Now, I mean, ideally you don't have the root system sitting in the reservoir and you have your wick in the reservoir hanging below. So to give you an example of the wick hanging below, so this is an anthurium luxuriant, as you can see. This is the newest leaf he popped out after I transferred him between climates. Um, again, the algae thing is real. It is an issue. I do have not flushed these guys in a while, but ooh, look at those roots. So this one actually does have roots sitting in the reservoir. And you can see the wicks are kind of mixed in there and they're going pretty green from the algae. Let's see if we can get a closer look there. Good roots for sure. Um, they are busting loose out of this orchid pot. And I will get to the orchid pots momentarily. I try to keep at least 20 to 25% of reservoir below the bottom of the net pot, which means that like for a, a net pot this height, I'm gonna need a pot that's probably an extra, uh, you know, inch and a bit underneath it. And that way I've got my wicking kind of hanging through here. I'll just use this wicking I've got conveniently handy as an example. And I've got that hanging loose into my pot so that when I am watering, I only need to fill up to about maybe here, just above the bottom of the net pot. And then that wicking in here will wick up into the LECA and then it will dampen the LECA and kind of trigger that capillary action that will keep everything moist. The big problem that you're gonna run into though is uh, if your wicking doesn't go high enough, that LECA and particularly my experience with pond has been this way, the top surface layer, even down a solid, centimeter or two centimeters below that is going to stay pretty dry if you've got it out in room climate. So if you don't have a high humidity environment around that container, the top layer of your semi-hydro is going to stay pretty dry and that can be problematic primarily for aerial roots. If you're dealing with a crawler, it's kind of tough because your crawler has the majority of its stem sitting on top of that substrate and then it's trying to root in and it's dry. So for me, I try and get the wicks as high as I can up there. So when it comes to pros and cons for the net pots, keep in mind, these are not necessary. You can keep your LECA or your pond directly in your pot, that's fine. It just makes cleaning a lot easier because I can take this out and I can clean the pot and I can pop it back in. That works with your cover pots. It works with your deli pots. It works everywhere. So cleaning is simpler. You just don't need to do it. You can have a glass jar or vessel if you want to do that. I find with the glass, it just makes it like taking all the leck out to clean it is pretty much impossible. And sometimes you even have to break the container to get it out, which is bad news. I prefer the simplicity of being able to pull out the net pot. Now, I mean, you do trade off on space 
Like as you can see here, I'm taking up space for a reservoir. I've got some space around the edges where my plant can't root as easily because it's got to work its way out of the net pot. Um, and then, you know, the reservoir space is something that for some plants, you don't want to have that root system sitting in the reservoir. Again, certain plants are okay with it, certain plants aren't. So keep that in mind when you're working through it. So wasted space is not that big of a deal. Talking about wicking. Wicking is something that if you're not familiar with, uh, and I showed you guys this earlier, this is the flat wick that came with that crawler pot. Um, wicking is something that you can find pretty easily on Amazon, etc. I'll drop a couple of links to this in the description below. But uh, there's different kinds of wicking and it's important to know like what size you're getting on the way through. I have two different sizes here. This one is a little bit skinnier. Uh, this one's a little bit thicker. This the, the thickness of the cord is really important depending on what you're doing and depending on the size of the pot you're dealing with. Now, if you're dealing with one of these smaller guys, you're going to want the thinner cord. So make sure that thickness of the cord that you're working with is appropriate for the the holes in your net pot, particularly if you're using these uh, net pots that have very small holes. Um, even this bigger net pot still has pretty small holes. Uh, if you're using these guys that have quite a bit like wider holes in them, um, then the thicker wicking works much better here. And it's also more effective. I think like the thickness of the wicking is directly proportionate to the amount of water that's being wicked up into your substrate. So these guys, you can buy them in like 50, 100 foot lengths. They are pretty easy to come by. Just search for a wicking and you will find them. It's like a big long rope. So it comes like that in a big package. I've got tons of it. Like this guy came in like a three pack. So this is altogether 150 feet that came together. And you do burn through that wicking pretty good. I would say that for a pot like this, I'll use two strands in a pot like this and I will kind of uh, interleave them like an X form at the bottom and I will have six to eight inches times two in here. So yeah, I could easily get a foot maybe even 14 inches uh, of wicking into one of these. And I'll run the wicking pretty high up like starting around here with like one loop coming down uh, and then another loop across with it. So like they'll go crisscross across here and then I will fill up the substrate to a certain point and I'll kind of pack the wicking into that substrate in and around the root system of whatever plant I'm putting in there. So I basically just want to try and permeate the substrate. So like in this case, Leca for instance, uh, I want to permeate that, that substrate as much as I can with the wicking material so the water can kind of get around. So you're basically just helping it out at the end of the day. You want, you want it to be more effective in how it does its capillary action and how it's pulling that water through and the wicking just kind of gives it like a, a superpower kind of pumping it up as i mentioned wicking you can pick that up big packages are pretty easily available i would suggest grab yourself a big package of a couple of different sizes and you can work with that and just snip what you need and if it doesn't fit one pot it most likely will fit another pot when it comes to net pots the other thing i want to talk about is orchid pots now orchid pots used for orchids, right? Um, they're also used for, you know, if I want to put a propagation in sphagnum moss, for instance, if I want to throw it into something like tree fern fiber, which I'm not super comfortable with yet. I've only just purchased some tree fern fiber recently. And if you want to do that, these are good pots for it. I've got a number, I think four different sizes of, I, I have at least one more size floating around too. Um, but you know, they they come in again, almost the same size range as what you'll find the net pots in. Their purpose is different. This is ideally meant for an orchid, but I find these super useful for semi-hydro as well. So the form factors are different. So beware of what you're buying. Like this guy has slits on the sides and slits at the bottom. So it means that running wicking through here can be a little bit of a pain. So I typically use a small screwdriver to kind of push that wicking through the bottom. It can sometimes deform the slits a little bit. With this guy, all of the holes are on the bottom, nothing on the sides. I can run smaller wicking material through these semicircle holes here. I can run that through there and it works great. So these guys come in different sizes as well. I mean, this is probably kind of like a jumped up version of that. Uh, again, these kind of match up like there's your two inch, your three inch, your four inch, and there's like five, four and a half, etc. They all there. There's at least a half size in between most of these. I think this guy I want to say is like a four inch. It might be a four and a half. Again, this one is just the bottom. It's got a good lip on the edge, which is very handy. Um, that lip is super useful, and I'll show you in a second why it is. Versus my little guy here has no lip. The lip on these guys is pretty handy. They serve different purposes, but I mean, these are useful as well because they fit really well into a lot of the solo cups. You can pop them in here. I stick out the top, 
I've got like maybe a centimeter sticking out of the top, and then I've got most of this able to sit inside, and I've got a pretty good reservoir at the bottom there, which is pretty cool. And as I showed you earlier, my Hoya SP Gununga Ding is sitting in one of these little guys as well with two strands of wicking running through and crisscross into the reservoir, and it's got a solid like inch and a half reservoir at the bottom here, which is really nice. And that means I don't have to have too much water flowing up into the actual substrate itself. So this guy is sitting in Pawn. This is DIY Pawn. I don't buy the real stuff because A, it's really hard to find, and B, I'm cheap. So um, I've made my own combination of zeolite, lava rock, and pumice. Mine is in equal parts. I know some folks use different combinations and proportions depending on how they're feeling. Some people also throw in perlite or some things like orchiata or orchid bark and small density type pieces. Those are all fine options. There's the other aspect of this is the type of substrate that you're using, whether it's Leca or Pawn. But I think the main takeaway from these types of containers, particularly the ones with these small holes at the bottom or this larger one, again, the holes are not too big, is that they work really well with Pawn. Uh, that's something that when I get back to my net pots here, these don't work well with Pawn, but they work great with Leca. So, if you are using both Leca and Pawn, or if you're planning to use both of those, I would suggest that you pick up both a combination of net pots and orchid pots and work with whatever suits the medium that you're working with. The other benefit of these net pots is that it's it's not dissimilar to your fabric pot that you would use outside if you're using one of those big fabric pots for your tomato plants, for instance. You know, they encourage root branching and like root pruning, like air pruning of the roots. Um, in the case of the net pots, you get a lot of root branching through here that you wouldn't necessarily get otherwise. I think it's just the fact that it has to fight its way through not only your LECA or your other substrates that you're using, but also the slits of the pot make for um, a pretty healthy root system. Like particularly my alocasias, they go crazy in here. Monstera, alocasia, some philodendrons, some not. Um, and then Anthuriums, I tend to lean more towards using Pawn and the Orchid Pots. Now, if you plan on using Pawn or Leca or both, or Pumice or Perlite or whatever you feel like doing, uh, take a look at the containers that you're gonna use. If you're planning on using Leca, then you can probably get away with the containers that have the wider gaps in the base and the sides. If you're working with Pawn, I would suggest you probably aim more towards something like this, where it's got the solid sides and the smaller holes at the bottom, and it still has room to run your wicking. I think the one thing I would say caution-wise is, depending on the type of plant you're using, keep those gaps in mind, because certain root systems work better with the wider gaps in your netting versus others. So anthuriums have very thick roots, monsteras have very thick roots, something like an epipremnum or a hoya, for instance. In my hoyas, I keep those in the orchid pots and their roots are so small and tiny and skinny that you know, they do root quite well, but I do like to keep them in something where they have a bit more of a compact root system and it's less likely to bust out through the holes. So keep that in mind when you're purchasing your net pots as well. Again, it gives you options. Again, the, the orchid pots come in larger sizes too. I picked, I think the majority of these orchid pots I have picked up from North Shore Tropicals, which is very close to me. Hi, Lauren. I have purchased a lot of stuff there. I would also suggest that you can find those at your local hydroponics store or online. There's a number of good hydroponics stores. If you're in Canada, I've used uh, Indoor Growing Canada, I think they're called. Um, there's Indoor Farmer. There is Astral Grow out in Quebec. There's a few others out there. And John's Plant Factory here in Vancouver is fantastic as well. If you can't find what you're looking for at one, you will be able to find it at another one. There's a lot of choice out there. But what I would say is that you're probably gonna have better luck finding it there than you will at Amazon. I have had poor luck finding some of these kind of more specialized bits and pieces at Amazon, but I have found them in all these indoor hydroponics stores. So there's that. When it comes to buying your net pods or your orchid pods, this works equally well with the orchid pods because they both fit the same container. Match the diameter of your net pod or your orchid pod to the container size that you're working with. It's so nice to just be able to pull these guys out. And in this case, I don't have to use my electrical tape hack because the lip of this orchid pot sits directly over the lip of the deli pot. With these guys, it's a little bit more difficult. They sit a little bit recessed inside. And then to pull it out, it's hard if you've got semi-hydro medium in there. So I do have to use the tape 
to get them out. So again, it's kind of what you got on hand, but if you have time to measure those diameters and match them up, you will be in much better shape. So learn from my mistakes. With the larger net pots, like this guy here, I want to say is a seven inch Grow Pro. Does it have a size written on here? No, it doesn't. I think that is the number one annoyance of these containers is that there is no sizing written on here. And it's pretty consistent that you have to guess at the sizing or you just have to physically freaking measure it yourself. Um, this is the Ikea pot I was showing you earlier. It's a good one. I think this is a six inch pot. This one, you know, again, I can't, at least the, the number's on the bottom here. So if you're you're curious, you can go find it. But I believe this is a six inch one, but this fits pretty well inside here. So I can sit that in there. And as you can see, uh, maybe you can see that there. There's a decent reservoir. Like it actually sits a good inch to an inch and a half, probably about an inch and a half off the bottom. So I can throw some wicking in here and I can put a pretty good sized plant in here. And if I need to rinse it out, I just take the whole net pot out with the plant in it and go rinse it out. And I can throw in some new neutron solution and I'm gold, gold pony boy. If you're in a situation where your plant is rooted so thickly through here that you need to cut it out, I would say that if you have that option, it's a hell of a lot easier to cut your plant out of one of these net pots because this is pretty flimsy plastic at the end of the day. Versus one of these guys, you're gonna have to surgerize this pretty hard to get your plant out. In this case, although you're probably gonna have more of the problem having roots sticking out, you can just literally cut through this with a pair of scissors and bust it off of there and you won't lose too many roots. Now we were talking about net pots. There's another cool aspect of the net pot thing that I haven't mentioned. And this is not so much net pots. This is more your typical pots with holes, but it's kind of how you use them. So if you do a lot of propagation, like let's say you want to do some commercial propagation, or at least you want to start your own small business and you want to sell from your grow tent and you've got a grow tent with some shelving and you can fit some of these prop trays in there. So prop trays typically, I mean, if you do a seedling tray, it's gonna be a 1020, which is typically, I think they're like 10 inch by 20 and a half approximately. Um, I might be off by a half an inch in one direction or a quarter inch in another, but they call them 1020 trays and that's pretty commonly known as like the seedling tray that you see two squares side by side. Those trays will fit a number of these square pots, which I find super handy. There's these guys. Um, so if you're using Leca, these are awesome. Uh, this is a five and a half inch. This fits very nicely into your seedling trays. Square, which means it's efficient use of space. So if you're in a rectangular seedling tray, you're gonna end up like this. There you go. I can fit eight of these guys into one seedling tray. And I can then throw a good inch and a half of nutrient solution at the bottom here because this is a deeper tray. And this one is actually a thick plastic tray. So I've got probably a good bit of give to it, but I can fit eight up in here. And these are all five and a half inch. So I can put a lot of plants in there. So if I'm in my greenhouse or in my grow tent and I've got good climate control in there and I've got good high humidity and I don't have to worry about airflow too much because I've got a ventilation system set up, which is what I've got, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not too worried about having these plants out in open air, just kind of sitting in a tray, then I can throw each one of these guys filled up to the brim with LECA. You can put a pretty good root ball in here and I can put eight of those in one tray. In the same vein, if you're using a seedling tray is these guys. This is a nine by nine centimeter square by 10 vertically. Yeah, I can fit 18 of these square containers. So that's 18 in one seedling tray, which is Fantastic. And you can put a pretty good size cutting in here. And you can, again, fill this up with LECA. Look at those holes. I, I wouldn't suggest putting pond in here, but if you were to use some sort of like landscape fabric at the bottom, you could probably get away with using pond in there too, but it's just a kind of a pain in the butt. You're welcome to try it and let me know how it works out in the comments. I am curious to know. There's a lot of these guys. You can find them all over the place and they come in different sizes. Just when you're doing the math, Make sure you can fit the actual containers into your 10 by 20 tray. The 1020s fit certain form factors well, certain form factors not so well. So over here, I have a stack of these tall boys, which are really good for, I mean, for me, I would say uh, a lot of philodendrons that have pretty large root systems or anthuriums, like an anthurium that has a big, long stem on it. That happens a lot, particularly when you're importing. Those guys, this is perfect for putting those guys into Leca or even Pawn. Although, I mean, again, the holes are a little large on this, but you can fit these guys into those trays as well. I think these are four and a half inch. 
Um, and so they don't fit quite so well. These are Sunblaster brand, if anyone's curious. I did buy these, again, from my favorite hydroponics store, John's Plant Factory. So um, I think that covers pots. Uh, it covers net pots. We're in pretty good shape here. So the one caveat I'd say with the whole seedling tray approach is that you do prevent yourself from using some of these humidity domes. This guy, you know, normally would sit on top of a seedling tray. These are really great. I use them for, you know, propagations, prop boxes, that sort of thing. If I'm propagating in a seedling tray, it works great. When you're using these larger containers, even with the three and a half inch or whatever this is, uh, like the nine by nine by 10 centimeter containers, even with that, it just doesn't fit super well under the edge here. And it's not a comfortable fit. So you win some, you lose some, but if you're in a grow tent, it's probably less of an issue. If you're trying to grow it in an open space, like your living room or something like that, or your bedroom, then you might be hurting yourself by using those pots. So I'd say they have their purpose and they have their drawbacks. You just gotta figure out what's gonna work for you. Again, I, I, I like variety and I like having the ability to choose between a bunch of different options. So I tend to just get everything and then see how it works. Maybe that makes me a bit of a, a waster, but but, you know, why not? Quickly, I wanted to show you guys a couple of little optional tweaks and adjustments you can make to the pots and whatnot that I mentioned before. First off, this is again a solo cup. This guy here is my Anthurium Crystallinum Red which I just picked up. Um, again, living in Vancouver, it is awesome. I have access to a lot of stuff that I would not be able to get very easily otherwise. So this here, I'll see if I can show you guys what that looks like. That there is sitting in a solo cup and this is soda pop lid. Honestly, you can buy these things separately, but this is just a lid that fits nicely on top of these guys and keeps the humidity in. In my case, I've got like a combination of all sorts of fun crap in here. There's, I think this one's mostly Leca with uh, sphagnum moss on top, but it gives it quite a bit of height to grow and then once I get to a certain point, I can do some other fun stuff to keep everything inside of this humidity vessel. So this guy I've just got sitting on a heat mat under an LED light in my guest room, sitting on top of my Millsbow Tall. I kept it in isolation for a decent amount of time here. I've had it for probably three weeks now and it's put out this top leaf that's looking nice. It was very small when I got it. Uh, it did lose one bottom leaf, seedling leaf came off and that was just probably from transition shock, I would think. But looking good and it's growing, so I'm happy. Now, again, when I mentioned like once it gets a little too tall from that container, you can go for this route. So this is my, again, 16 ounce deli container and I've doubled it up with one on top. So I've got quite a bit of vertical height here, maybe not as much spread as I would like. And I've got my trusty electrical tape wrapping around this so I can kind of pop it open if I want to. This is an Anthurium Dock Block F2 hybrid. I am really looking forward to seeing how this guy turns out. He's looking pretty good in there so far. I'm not going to open him up, but you can kind of see what's going on inside there. He's looking pretty tasty. And once I've got him out in the open, I will show you guys. He actually has a brand new leaf popping in. I don't know if you can see that super well. Right in the middle there, this kind of little spear shaped guy. And that's gonna be a new leaf. And this was the last leaf that popped out. So we'll see, it should be bigger than that one, hopefully. Uh, again, these deli containers and your solo cups come in super handy. So if you are just getting started with semi-hydro, stock up on those, you will find an infinite number of uses for these things. Just to show you that these orchid pots here can serve other purposes and not only work with pond like my Anthurium Luxurians back here, they can also work with Leca just as well. Uh, I have this guy here. This is an Alocasia Dragon Scale variegated. Um, pretty sweet. It's got like an Aurea variegation on there, which I think is spectacular. The awesome thing about this guy is that when I transplanted him out of the original substrate, he had a whole pile of pups already ready to go. So when I grabbed him, he was ready to rock. And in this case, I wanted a little bit more space than my um, net pots were offering. So I popped him into Leca inside of one of these orchid pots. Again, with the wicking, you can see here, it's sitting pretty nicely. And he's got, I don't know if the roots are showing yet. Yeah, there you go. But he's rooting nicely in here. He's sitting in a container on a heat mat right now. He's got a new growth point coming in right there. And that's going to be very nice when it's ready because that wasn't there a few days ago. 
So I'm looking forward to seeing what the new leaf variegation looks like on this guy. So if it wasn't obvious that I really love these solo cups for various propagation purposes, here's an example. These are the five quorums I pulled out of that alocasia green dragon scale. Those are all starting to root up in here. I know that with alocasia and variegation, you're not guaranteed variegation on the corms. So hopefully we end up with some variation in there. I took out, I believe six corms and I've got five of them that have started to root or put out a first leaf or both out of this already. So this is working pretty good. These will move into, and I think, you know, corms are probably a little less risky when it comes to introducing them to the rest of your collection. But uh, with the parent plants, it's something that you have to be very concerned with. So whether you're using semi-hydro or soil or moss, there's every potential for uh, introducing nasty stuff into your collection if you're not careful. So quarantine, 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 quarantine. So I keep my stuff under grow lights or under LED lights heat mats, and a lot of plastic storage boxes. Those things are very handy as well. They're not really kind of semi-hydro specific, so I'm not bringing them up here, but I have a lot of those floating around. So I wanted to kind of cap this off with a few little accessories here and there that I use for semi-hydro for the most part. Um, I'll kind of burn through these quickly because I'll probably do an accessories discussion separately. I, just like we talked about uh, nutrients and we talked about growing media accessories. There's so many of them that I, I'm just going to pull out a few of the ones I think are pretty useful and you guys can work through that. You may have noticed that a lot of my items are very nicely labeled. I'll link this guy in the description below, but like, this is a faux memo label printer and it's one of those heat printer type deals. This thing is spec fucking tacular. I love it. Uh, I have gotten so much use out of this. It takes a roll in there of tape and I'm still on the first batch that I've got. I've printed hundreds of labels in this thing and it is awesome. It's got this print master app that you run on your phone that lets you create labels super easily. And I just put my labels in here. I type it up and I press print and it's all good. And I love it, it's fantastic. Out of all the accessories that I have, that is the one I would probably recommend the most. The second one that I would recommend the most is this guy here. This is an LED headlight. This thing is awesome for indoor and outdoor growing. I use this thing all the time. I use it for inspecting plants. I may look ridiculous wearing this thing, but so useful outside in the dark, it's awesomely bright. It's got multiple levels. It's got all sorts of crazy stuff on it. It's rechargeable, USB rechargeable. And I think it costs something like $18. That was probably one of my best plant purchases of all time. My wife bought that for me for Christmas as a stocking stuffer, I think a couple years ago. And it's the best, I love it. Moving on, other useful tools that I use with semi-hydro. Again, not specifically semi-hydro, but I had to mention it because it's so useful. This guy, I use to top off most of my plants when I'm watering. You know, you, you're gonna have like a big pump or whatever for your nutrient solution, but for kind of hand watering, this is just a 500 mil OXO squeeze bottle. So useful and it's easy to fill up. Since it's a half a liter, most of your measurements are pretty easy putting stuff in here. Squeeze, squeeze, works great. Soft plastic makes it, you know, you drop it, it's just gonna bounce a bit. Works fantastically well. I mentioned heat mats a lot. I've got a number of these guys. Just in case you're curious, you can buy them in a bunch of different sizes. I mean, you'll find the 1020 size very common here. So like 10 by 20 inch is probably your most standard because it fits under a seedling tray. So I mean, this one is a two pack of heat mats that are both 10 by 20 and three quarters. There's your size. Those work super, super well. They are extremely useful for all of my propagations, et cetera. And for, for imports that I keep in plastic tubs, I throw a heat mat under there and just keep it in there until I'm ready to, to take it out of isolation. Works great. What else do I have here? Got your pH meter. This is, this is more of a semi-hydro tooling, but in terms of gear, like, again, these things work great. I, I personally, like, don't fuss too much about the the pH, but they're pretty cheap. You can get them for like, I wanna say like 15, maybe 20 bucks on the outside. Super handy as well. Last but not least, this stuff, super useful. The Velcro plant tape, get yourself a big roll of this. It comes with or without this dispenser thing. I just got it with the dispenser because it was the same price as without. It lasts quite a while. This stuff I used for everything. Um, and I'll use it, I'll show you how I'm using it on my last accessory here. This is a Syngonium T25 which I brought in from 
Eastern Canada not long ago, and it has put out this wonderful new leaf uh, since I put it on this moss pole. Now, moss pole, you say, that's not moss. No, it's not. This is actually Leka inside of this pole. And this is one of the poles from North Shore Tropicals. I will link them in the description below. North Shore Tropicals is again local to me and I shop there quite a bit as well, probably more than I should. This is the smallest size, which I think is a 12 inch. They come flat pack like this and you fold them into the appropriate shape. I won't do it right now because I'm not ready to use this one, but this is the smallest size. They also come in like a medium, which I think is like a 15 inch or something, maybe 14. And then there's a bit larger size. This is probably a little harder to deal with when it comes to Leka because it's a little taller. You can use it for moss, you can use it for Leka. The one thing I'd say recommendation wise is to stick with the translucent ones because I know uh, NST has been selling these clear ones lately. And I gotta say, I'm not a fan. I find this plastic of the clear moss poles to be quite a bit more flimsy than the translucent versions. And I would recommend that if you have to choose between the two and you have the option, if unless you're dead set on clear for your pole, then go with the translucent because the plastic is just a lot sturdier feeling. And I am tempted to return the clear one that I bought because I just, it feels too flimsy. So yeah, the, that's the moss pole here. Um, that's what it looks like in action. You can see there I'm using the Velcro plant tape at the bottom. This new leaf here has popped since I put it on here about a week ago. You can see here I've also got the um, wicking material, which is still damp. Isn't that cool? This is still damp all the way up here, and I've got that running through my Leka in the moss pole. I will give credit where credit is due on the recommendation of these moss poles. I believe it was Kevin at Hakuna La Planta. He was using these, and I'm like, he bought these from the store. That is literally five minutes drive for me. So I gunned it down there the same day and bought a whole batch of these, and I'm loving it so far. They sit really nicely inside of my net pots. They are easy enough to fill up. Um, I mean, you can use them for moss, obviously, tree fern fiber. You can use these guys with Leka and with Pawn. Uh, I haven't tried Pawn, but that's where the inspiration came. That was uh, Charmaine at Unplant Parenthood, which is an awesome channel. You should check that one out. She was using this with Pawn, and I think she had plastic wrap over top of it while she was filling it up. I haven't had the courage to try that yet. I'm tempted. I will try that on the first plant that I get that I feel like needs to go into pawn. So far, I've been working with just the Leka and these guys, and it's working pretty nicely. I do say that you're probably gonna need to buy more wicking material if you do this with Leka. I'm kind of zigzagging it up here. I know with a bigger pole, like large size poles, you may want to run two wicks up there, but I mean, it's keeping moist, which is a good sign, which means that my Leka in here is also gonna keep moist. So we'll see how this works. I will check back in again in a while. Once this guy has grown a bit, he's sitting in my tent and he's pretty happy. He's acclimated. He's rooting pretty nicely in there too. So, so far so good. Yeah, you know what? I think that's all I got to say today. I, if you have any interest in any other planty stuff, I will be posting on a more regular basis. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I haven't posted anything in a really long time, really long time being like two years now. I hadn't quit the hobby. I've actually been very active in the hobby and my channel is probably now gonna be focused on a combination of outdoor and indoor growing. So I'm going to publish a video kind of talking more about the channel purpose and how I'm gonna evolve that going forward. I intend to post on a more regular basis now. Like I'm gonna aim for weekly and kind of hope that I can maintain that type of schedule. I work in technology in a pretty time consuming gig. So hopefully I have the time to figure this out and we'll see what kind of rhythm I develop. I'd really like love to get into a weekly or bi-weekly cadence at some point. I think I have enough material for sure to talk about for you guys. If I can see some interest from viewers and people are starting to find the content worthwhile, then I will absolutely publish more of it. So again, I'm Nick with Propist, newly renamed channel, newly back to YouTube. I hope that you found this content interesting. I hope that I was able to give you some helpful pointers in your ongoing or new semi-hydro, passive hydro journey. And if you'd like to see more of this kind of content, please drop a like below, subscribe if you'd like to see more of this as well, and drop a comment if you'd like to give me some suggestions for future videos. All that being said, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching and I really appreciate your time and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.